Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody's doing well. And I also hope that you guys enjoyed yesterday's lecture and hopefully it was informative and educational and you guys now have a more or better understanding of how vaccines work. And hopefully if you're not vaccinated, you know how the technology works and you're gonna be willing to get vaccinated now. So today and basically the rest of um, the lectures I'm gonna um, put forward are gonna be focused on nutrition. I feel like um, in this country, people do not get educated enough on what proper nutrition is. And I feel like, um, if I'm not mistaken, the majority of you guys are gonna be graduating within the next year or two. Um, and so I feel like I'm hoping that some of the, these next few lectures are going, you'll be able to take stuff away from them. And if you have bad eating habits, maybe some of the information in here will help you change some of those. Um, so today is just going to be a, a basic intro to what nutrition is. And the outline is basically going to go as followed. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what macromolecules are and how our body is able to absorb them. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and define what a calorie is and what happens when you have an excess or a deficit of calories. Uh, I would like you guys to all know how to read a nutrition label. Um, you know, they're pretty straightforward, but there's some key things that I'm going to point out that I feel like are pretty important to really pay attention to when you're considering what food you're putting in your body. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of the food pyramid and how it's led to our current um, diabetes epidemic or pandemic now, um, and then how that has changed to my plate, and we're going to compare that to Harvard's healthy eating plate. Um, based off of Harvard's healthy eating plate, I'm going to highlight some of the main um, food groups and highlight some of the key nutrients that are within them that are actually good at promoting longevity and our overall um, health and well-being. So what I really want you to take away from these lectures are know what the macromolecules are. There's going to be three main ones um, and they all have a variety of names to them. I'm going to expose you to what those some of those names are today but when I go more in depth um, in the lectures that are dedicated to each respective macromolecule you have a better understanding of what some of these um, words mean. Um, I want you to understand how our body is actually able to break these down and how we're able to absorb these um, you know when the macromolecules are broken into their individual subunits. Um, understand what a calorie is and what excessive calorie intake leads to. Uh, understand the main differences between the Harvard's healthy eating plate versus the my plate. Uh, know what are the main food groups um, that I'm gonna cover and why some of the uh, foods that I highlight are good for us. And these are gonna be things that I'm gonna end up testing you guys on because I feel like this is knowledge I want you guys to take forward after my class. So we'll start off with the macromolecules of life. So there's three main ones. There's proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And so with proteins, there's very few names for them. There's really, you're really going to hear proteins, polypeptides, and amino acids. And I've covered this in um, the essential dogma of, of biology um, in a previous lecture, kind of talking about those different names. Um, but this is typically what you'll end up hearing when we're referring to proteins. Now, when we're referring to carbs, carbohydrates have a lot of different names to them. And so some of the ones I have listed here are carb, sugar, refined sugar, glucose, starch, fiber, and uh, saccharides. And so you're going to hear me use some of these words, um, but once I go into tomorrow's lecture talking about carbs, I'll kind of help you understand what each of these are, because they all are a type of carb, but the source and how our body processes them is a little bit different. Um, and then the last uh, macromolecule of life are the fats. And so names that you'll hear um, interchangeably with uh, fats are going to be lipids, cholesterol, triglycerides, um, and the omega-3s and 6s. 
And you might be looking here and saying, why is this fish here? Well, fish hat is high in omega-3 fatty acids. So um, I have highlighted basically the good kinds of uh, fats that um, can be found in these respective foods. So um, these macromolecules are found in all the food that we eat, but our body can't absorb them just as whole components. So what our body does is it basically breaks them down into their individual subunits of what make up these macromolecules. And the whole point of this is so our body can easier um, and efficiently absorb um, these molecules so it can be incorporated into the body. And so basically here I have um, the list of the respective macromolecules and their respective subunits. And so for carbohydrates, the simplest form is going to be a monosaccharide such as glucose. Um, with lipids, if you remember what the plasma membrane is made out of, those lipids are composed of two parts, the fatty acid tail and the uh, glycerol heads. And so those are going to be the individual subunits that make up uh, a basic lipid. With proteins, every protein is made up of a string of amino acids that are stuck together and our body breaks these proteins down so these amino acids can be absorbed by the body. When we um, look at how some of these macromolecules are absorbed in the body, they have to be broken down by respective enzymes. And so let's go ahead and go through each one of these as it goes through the GI tract. So when we're eating any kind of carb, we have an enzyme called amylase in our saliva. And basically what amylase does is break apart the carbohydrates into its um, mono and disaccharide forms. So basically one or two sugar molecules stuck together. And these are gonna be easier for the body to process later on. Um, as it makes its way through the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, um, it's mainly going to um, get absorbed in um, the small intestine. But while it's on its way to the small intestine, it's gonna be broken down by more amylases. So, you know, you're, when you're eating, you're not gonna be able to break down all of the material. So your GI tract is going to play a role in further processing some of this. Um, and so uh, basically your pancreas will secrete um, different enzymes and the enzyme to break down the carbohydrates is gonna be amylase and that's gonna break it down into its uh, disaccharide form. And then once it makes it to this, a small intestine, then you have another enzyme, disaccharidase, that are going to make them into their uh, monosaccharide form. So it's just one uh, sugar molecule, one glucose molecule. When it comes to fats, it's um, a little bit different in terms of how we absorb it. Um, I'm going to highlight it more when we're talking about the um, fat in the fat lecture. But basically, when we process the fat, because it's a bit hard for the body to absorb, the um, pancreas will end up secreting um, some enzymes called lipases. And these lipases are going to play a role in breaking down the fats into their fatty acid chain components. Um, but in order to really facilitate this breaking down, um, your liver releases these bile salts. And these bile salts are basically going to act as an emulsion, basically help the mixture, almost to give it as a soap, where it's able to um, break apart fatty acid material. And so these two things are going to be very important when it comes to breaking down lipids. Once it makes it to the small intestine where the majority of all nutrients is absorbed, um, you're going to have basically the singular forms of the respective compositions of lipids, fatty acids, and monoglycerides, where the body can absorb them and use it for whatever it needs. Um, proteins are going to be broken down by a few different enzymes, and it's really dependent on what part of the GI tract the um, proteins are in. So once we first um, uh, eat some proteins, once the proteins make it to the stomach, it's going to encounter this enzyme called pepsin. 
And the pepsin is basically going to fragment the protein into these polypeptide chains. And so if you remember, polypeptide chains are just a string of amino acids put together. Um, and so a string of amino acids are going to make up a whole protein. So this is just going to fragment it. So it's in smaller pieces. Um, once it continues to go through the GI tract, um, you're going to have more um, enzymes secreted from the pancreas uh, that are going to break these down into further smaller subunits. Um, and so the main enzymes that are going to facilitate this are trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypepsidase. Um, and so once, you know, the uh, amino acids are further broken down into their respective peptides. They're just, you know, shorter chains of what the polypeptides were. And then once it makes it to the um, small intestine, then you're going to have this um, other enzyme called peptidase that are going to fragment it into single amino acids. So instead of having a long chain that your body would have to absorb, it fragments it into one amino acid. So it's much easier for your body just to take in. It's also important to note that our body needs micronutrients. And so micronutrients are necessary for our growth and development. And a lack of these are going to manifest in disease, especially in the early stages of life. When I'm talking about uh, micronutrients in next week's lecture, I'll go ahead and highlight basically some of these key vitamins and minerals and what happens when you have too little or too much of them because too much can be a bad thing for some of them. So with the vitamins, you're gonna have two different types. You're gonna have the fat soluble kind and the water soluble kind. So the fat soluble kind are going to be absorbed just like the fats are absorbed. They basically go through this whole process because of their structure. And so the main um, fat soluble vitamins are vitamins A, D, E, and K, and they all have respective functions um, within the body, which I will highlight next week. Um, it is important to note because they are fat soluble and we have, we're able to store fat for long periods of time, um, these um, uh, fat soluble vitamins get stored in some fatty areas of our body. And so, it's important to note that with the, some of these fat soluble vitamins, too much can be a bad thing because it, it can lead to some kind of toxicity. Um, whereas the water soluble vitamins, they you know easily dissolve in water, and so if we if our body ever has too much of these, such as vitamin B or C, um, it can easily uh, secrete them out of the body. Uh, the other um, key micronutrients that we'll cover are minerals. And so um, here I have a list of some key minerals that are really important to be aware of. So you have sodium, chloride, and potassium. These are all going to be found, um, you know, throughout the body. They're all within cells and um, the bloodstream. Um, but what it really helps facilitate is um, a balance of the fluids. And so for example, if you have too much salt intake, um, basically the body's going to not only hold on to that salt, but salt likes to bind to water, or it's the other way around. Water binds to salts. Water likes to follow wherever salt goes. And so if you're having cells that are uptaking the sodium, then your cells are also going to be uptaking a bunch of water. So high salt um, diets will end up causing a lot of water retention for this reason. Um, the other minerals that you want to be aware of are calcium and magnesium, and these are going to be very important when it comes to bone health. Um, these are going to work in tandem with um, vitamin D um, to help facilitate the whole processing of being able to absorb the calcium so it can be used um, within the actual structure of the bones. Um, and then the other mineral I'd like to highlight is iron. So iron is very important in our body because it's found basically everywhere, but the place that you are going to find high concentrations of it are going to be in your red blood cells. And um, when I talk about iron in next week's lecture, I'll basically show you the structure on how this works. But basically, iron plays a role in um, combining some uh, proteins within your red, red blood cells that help carry the oxygen. And so if people that are... Um, 
uh, anemic or don't have a whole lot of iron, they're very, their body is very inefficient at carrying oxygen to the rest of the body. So, you know, make sure you get enough iron in your diet. And if you don't take a supplement, but iron is one of those minerals that you can have too much of, and it leads to some kind of cytotoxicity. Uh, so be aware of that. <clears throat> water. Our bodies are made up of mainly water. We come from water. That's how we all originated from the ocean. And then, you know, with evolution, now we're here. Um, and so here I have highlighted um, the um, composition of some of the organs in terms of the percentage of the water that's in them. And so we can see some of our key um, organs that play a role in how we think and how we function, such as the brain and the heart are mainly consistent of water. So you really need to make sure you stay hydrated. Um, and you know, believe it or not, your bones are also made out of water. Even though we associate it with being this hard, dense material, bones are made out of cells and all cells have water. Um, so you know, it's, it's imperative that you are drinking enough water every day. Um, and you know, people are always saying, how much water do I need to drink? And, you know. Honestly, the best way to really do that, I would say a minimum of like uh, eight cups, so 64 ounces. Uh, but it's, you know, going to be dependent on if you're doing a lot of exercise, if you're in hot weather, just like we are in Riverside, then you're going to want to take more. Um, and so also, you know, utilize your urine um, as a source to see how much, um, if you need to basically dilute um, your body more with water. Um, you know, the more concentrated, uh, your pee looks and the more yellow it is. And that means that the more your body's trying to hold on to water because it's dehydrated. Um, if we do not drink enough water, do these percentages decrease? That's a good question. Uh, yes, the, because it's all in relative to proportion. So if you're drinking less water, some of your water is going to be used up. Um, and so some of these numbers might end up decreasing. The body's pretty good at regulating itself, so the numbers shouldn't change drastically. The area that will probably change mainly is going to be in the blood. And so if you were to take a blood sample um, and look at the plasma component of somebody that's um, dehydrated versus somebody that's well hydrated, you're going to see that um, in the people that are dehydrated, you're going to have very little plasma because that's where all your water is going to be at within your blood versus somebody that's well hydrated the majority of i think close to half of your um, blood composition is plasma which is majority made out of water um but yeah your body's really good at regulating this so most of these organs they're not going to change like a drastic amount um but you know keep your body hydrated um <clears throat> Your, the water does, you know, a, a variety of different things. And, you know, just to, to highlight some of these, um, you know, when, when we're eating, we, our, our saliva uses water and we need the saliva, which is going to have the enzymes such as amylase to break down some of the um, uh, sugars. Uh, you're going to have, you have mucosal membranes all throughout your body. And um, I didn't highlight this for the, just the scope of the class, but I'll just quickly mention mucosal membranes have immune cells present there. There's um, the whole point is, you know, keep another layer of defense against the body. Um, and you need to keep these areas moist. So you basically have mucus constantly being secreted so it can keep pathogens at bay. Um, you really want to, you know, flush out toxins. The way that you're going to flush out toxins is by drinking the water. Because once your body has enough water in it, it's going to um, automatically absorb what it needs and then excrete whatever it does. And so, um, you know, the more water you're, you know, using the filter out um, through your kidneys is going to be um, a lot better um, than if, say, if you were chronically dehydrated. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to highlight. Um, and you know, this one's an obvious one. Water is going to regulate your body temperature. If you're, um, you know, chronically dehydrated, you're going to notice that your body's going to run a lot hotter, hotter than normally, um, compared to if you were not. Um, and so water is very important when it comes to the homeostasis of keeping your body at a relatively normal temperature. 
And so, you know, it's, it's good that you can drink water, but you also want to get water from different sources. And so here I have a list of pictures of uh, foods that are rich in water. And so, uh, and I'll end up emphasizing this when we're talking about fruits and vegetables, but, you know, fruits, vegetables, they're all cells and all cells have water in them. And so these are all going to be very good sources of, um, um, which we call it, uh, water sources along with other kinds of um, minerals. Uh, yeah, someone asked, is our body capable of breaking down alcohol? Absolutely. Um, I'm not gonna really talk about it in this class, um, but yes, our body has the ability to break down alcohol. Um, because I'm not gonna go into depth about it, I can go ahead and you know, say a little bit of what I know. Um, basically, when alcohol is being processed in our body, um, there are two uh, main enzymes that facilitate this process, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase one and two. And so for a fun fact for some of you people, um, uh, the reason why I'm sure some of you guys have heard of Asian glow, where um, uh, some Asians will end up uh, developing like a flush red face because um, they were drinking. And sometimes this happens after just like half a drink. Um, it has to do with um, they lack uh, dehydrogenase two. They, they lack the enzyme to be able to that for that second step to break down the alcohol. So um, there's many ways that the body breaks down alcohol, um, but they're the easiest way is by using those enzymes. And so if it doesn't have those enzymes, then it's going to shuttle that um, alcohol um, metabolite into a different metabolism mechanism. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, so it's going to, and usually those mechanisms are a lot slower than just using those enzymes. And so that's why um, some people will get that flushed face after a drink. Um, so what is a calorie? Um, hold on, someone asked, and are though there ways in changing that? Uh, unfortunately, not unless you can crisper in the gene to, um, you know, <laughs> express that enzyme, but um, unfortunately your genetics are your genetics, uh, so you cannot change that unfortunately. Uh, at least science has not found a way to do that. Um, what is a calorie? So a calorie is just a unit of energy. So, you know, if you've ever taken any other science classes, joules is another way um, that energy is expressed. Um, but for the context of talking about nutrition, we're going to be focused on a calorie. Um, and so the energy we put into our body is going to come from these macromolecules that I talked about in the, the first couple of slides. Um, and so when we look at the back of a food label that um, says how many calories are in the, the product, um, it's actually not a calorie that it's referring to. Uh, it's referring to a kilocal. Um, so basically, if you multiply that number by a thousand, then that's what the actual true calorie is. Um, and so you'll see, see people use calorie with an uppercase, which denotes kilocal. Um, and if it uses a lowercase um, cal, then you know it's decreased by a factor of a thousand. But most people will end up showing it in one of these two forms. And so a a calorie or a, a kilocal is the amount of energy it takes to heat one kilogram of water um, by one degree Celsius. And so when food scientists are trying to figure out how much, um, how many calories are, are in something, they basically will end up burning it, um, but they'll burn it into this chamber that is surrounded by water. And depending on how much, um, it, how much energy it takes to burn that food and for it to raise it um, that one degree Celsius, that's how they determine um, the amount of energy that's within that particular um, food product. So each macromolecule has a certain amount of energy in it. So the macromolecule that's going to have the most um, energy in it is going to be fat. And that comes to nine calories per gram. Um, versus both carbs and proteins, they both are around um, four calories per gram. It's important to understand and note that to burn one pound of fat, which is like 453 grams of fat, um, we're going to need 
to basically use up 3,500 calories worth of energy. And there's going to be three main ways that our body can facilitate this um, breakdown and burning of energy. So the first one is going to be your, your basal meta metabolomic rate. And so this is going to be just, you know, our normal bodily function. Every cell in your body is using, utilizing this energy for some kind of function, um, either, you know, to incorporate it into its membrane somehow, such as fats, um, or facilitate the breakdown of the sugar so it can generate uh, ATP, which I'll talk about in tomorrow's lecture. Um, all of this requires energy to do. And so um, basically the majority of the time, um, our body is already in the process of doing this. It takes energy to digest food, and this is gonna be about five to 10% of your calories. So, you know, we, ha we have to produce all of these enzymes um, to break down the food, making those enzymes takes energy. Um, on top of that, to transport those, so after you break down all of the macromolecules, to transport those subunits after they're broken down into the actual intestine and into the cells, all of that requires additional work. And so all of that additional work is going to cause more calories to be used. Um, the last um, way of being able to burn calories is through exercise. And the amount of calories is really going to be dependent on the type of exercise you're doing and for how long you're doing it. Um, and so that's why I can't really give you a um, number uh, as to, you know, how many calories can burn because they're really very. Uh, do I think L-carnitine uh, is efficient for metabolism? You know, I don't know. I can look into this. And when I'm talking about the proteins, um, I could see um, its actual function. Because uh, when I am talking about the different amino acids, I am going to highlight a couple of key ones that um, facilitate, uh, you know, the, the processing of certain um, neurotransmitters for making us happy, um, as well as a couple of other things in terms of, you know, making the muscles in our body. Um, if I recall properly, I think this particular amino acid plays a role in wound healing. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me if it is processing in that, then, you know, there is metabolism that needs to be done. Um, but to actually like process food and stuff like that, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. All right. So how much, um, how much, how many calories does your body actually need? Um, and you know, this is all going to be dependent on what you're asking your body to do. And so here I have a nice diagram of what, um, a typical, um, woman or man, uh, needs, uh, in terms of their calorie intake per day based on their weight. And what this, uh, what these graphs really highlight are the, um, levels of activity that are present. And so say you're, um, I don't know, oops, say we're a, a 200 pound man and you have, uh, you know, you, you don't do really any exercise. You're just sitting all the time, basically to not gain any weight and to keep that typical um, steady state weight, uh, you're going to want to basically eat within this uh, caloric range. Now, if you're like a bodybuilder or you're um, training for a marathon or something like that, um, you know, that's going to be a lot of high activity for your body to be, uh, you know, expending for calories. And so that means that you can go ahead and if you want to maintain that same weight, you basically need to eat more of those calories uh, to main, to not go into any kind of deficit. Um, and so, you know, have a, have a look at this. I think I have a link to this particular site. So um, if you're having trouble seeing some of this, you can go to the site and kind of have an idea of um, what, um, how many calories you should be intaking. But, you know, just disclaimer, this is just an estimate. There are other factors that you need to consider when it comes to um, figuring out how many calories you your body really needs 
Um, but typically when it comes to the ratio of um, how we put on weight and the calories we intake and use, um, these graphs are going to be relatively good um, when it comes to the estimation. So I'm going to want you to read um, food labels. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys know how to do that or have even considered it. Um, but I remember when I was calorie counting a few years ago, um, you know, I, I put a lot of things in perspective. And so here I have the list of two of my favorite foods, berry pie and ice cream. And so let's go ahead and compare these two when you're looking at the food labels. So the first thing you want to look at are the calories, you know, and to give you some context, um, a typical person will, um, you know, have roughly two, they'll require about 2000 calories in a day. Um, and, you know, going back to that last graph, it's going to be dependent on your weight and a couple of other factors, but just for simplicity, all of these um, values that are on here are all based off of using a 2000 uh, calorie a day intake. Um, all right. So if I look at the calories of this pie, it's basically one fourth of my daily intake. So that, that's a shit ton. Um, and so if I look at my ice cream, it says 170. So, so okay, that, that's not bad. That seems less, right? So I can go and eat the whole thing, right? No, of course not. Look at the serving size of the um, container. So here, the serving container is basically the whole pie. So whatever is present here is going to be the whole amount of calories that are present. When I look at the um, serving size here, basically two thirds of a cup of ice cream or 89 grams has 170 calories in it. So when I look at the number of uh, serving sizes per container, I notice that this one has nine. So to figure out how many calories are within this whole ice cream, I'm going to end up multiplying this number by nine. And, you know, it's, I think, a little over a thousand. Um, so that's, you know, half of your calories for the day. Um, and that's not, um, you know, uh, in, uh, considering all the other, you know, components to it that are going to have an effect on the body. Um, you're going to want to look at the proportion of the macromolecules. So always look at your fats, your carbohydrates, and your proteins. Um, and so you really want to be eating stuff that are high in proteins and um, low in fat. You're also going to want things that are low in sugar when you're looking at the carbs. But what you really want to pay attention to is the amount of fiber that's present. So, you know, there's some fiber in this, so it's not bad. Uh, but the amount of added sugar and, um, you know, the amount of sugar that's in it is a ridiculous amount. Um, and so this is 26% of your daily value. Um, and so uh, with my total carbohydrates here, this is it's 8%. But if you multiply that by nine, then, you know, it's a lot more. Um, so, you know, always look at how much added sugar. So, you know, when you make things or when things are being made, um, there's already going to be some natural sugar in some of the things that are used, just like fruit. Uh, but um, the food industry will add excessive sugar to it to make it taste sweeter. And this excessive sugar is going to be a big problem and lead to diabetes. Um, so really pay attention to that when it comes to looking at these food labels. Um, you're going to want to look at the ingredients of whatever it is that you're looking at. So I don't have it listed here just for space. Um, but basically, the longer the list that you see on there, the more processed the food is. And you really don't want to be eating a lot of processed food. We live in America. It's very difficult to not eat processed food. Um, but if you can minimize it, um, that would be best. So I don't know how many of you guys have seen this food pyramid before. I feel like majority of you guys are old enough to have, you know, seen it in within, you know, this range that it was um, administered. So it, uh, the food pyramid debuted in 1992 and was used all the way until 2005. And, you know, we trust the government, right? We, the, this is put out by the USDA, so United States Department of Agriculture. 
and um, you know, telling us that these are all the good things that we need to incorporate in our diet if we're going to be healthy and whatnot. Um, but you know, years later, uh, it turns out that this pyramid was really modified to fit corporate greed. Um, the industry, the food industry, had a big say on the design of this um, pyramid as well as you know, how many serving sizes for some of these things. Um, in this link here, I highly recommend watching it. Um, they basically talk about how some of the scientists that were part of the, the USDA um, you know, recommended certain things. This um, pyramid looked drastically different from the recommendations, but after they tried to submit it through the, the proper channels, the um, food industry lobbyists basically critiqued a lot of um, whatever was um, whatever the scientists had said, um, saying that basically it's, it's going to hurt business. Um, and so, uh, you know, milk got its um, own section, and uh, you know they they had a say in terms of like the style and everything to try to make it everything more appealing. And because of this, we're now left with a uh, diabetes pandemic. Um, so this, this the main, you know, critiques aside from that is this guy does not distinguish between what good um, versus bad carbs, proteins, or fats are. And I'm not sure how many of you guys are aware of, um, you know, that there's good versions of each one of these as well as bad, because I feel like with all the fad diets and whatever is out there, we think of all sugars as being bad or all fats as being bad, but no, there's good and bad versions of all. Um, let's see, I'm reading some, um, what, so the U S department of agriculture is the one that, um, controls our, uh, mainly our food. The FDA is mainly going to be focused on the drugs. Uh, let's see, what else did I miss? Isn't America the fattiest? Uh, uh somebody asked, isn't America the fattest country in the world? Um, it was for the longest time, I believe. Uh, I have to look at the stats. Um, you know, I'll probably incorporate that into tomorrow's lecture as well. Uh, who is the fattest country? Um, I, I want to say Mexico has overtaken it. The last time I saw, but I, I need to. I need to double check that. Um, let's see. Gosh, I think it's my training diet. Um, yeah, I, somebody says, I think the Mediterranean diet is pretty healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, I think in one of the next week's lectures, um, I'm going to talk about some of these um, diet fads and, um, you know, what, which ones are the best ones and which ones I think are pure shit. Um, and, you know, me understanding the science behind, behind how our bodies actually process some of this stuff, um, I, I give you, you know, clear cut arguments against like, I'm completely against the keto diet. Um, and once we get to that, I, you know, I will present my case because I'm sure some people out there are interested in doing the keto diet, which I'm not saying it doesn't work. Of course it works. Um, but it's not healthy. And um, hopefully you'll be able to extrapolate some of that uh, um, after I go through some of this lecture. But um, yes, the Mediterranean diet is the best because in my opinion, it is the most well-balanced. Um, and it's going to have some of the, um, uh, you know, carb or the, the good kinds of all these macromolecules in them. Yeah, long-term keto is not healthy. I, I don't think even short term. Um, all right. So, you know, to put it in perspective, the food market's dominated by 10 corporations. Oops. Um, so, you know, you see all these different brands out there in the, um, in the store, but, you know, it's the same, it's the same company, just many different faces. Um, so you think that, you know, one brand is competing with another um, within the actual corporation, but it's the same one. It's all about marketing. Um, and if you don't think that the food industry has a, an influence on what happens in our government, like you're, you're sadly mistaken. Um, yeah, here I have a statistic of in 2011, the food industry donated uh, $318 million in political campaigns to these respective parties. Um, and, you know, the whole point of this is to basically, if you scratch my back, I'm going to scratch yours. 
Um, and so, you know, that's why we had the, um, the food pyramid to begin with. We had people basically getting bought out and that's why we have the broken system that we do. This, lead, this has led us to a very sad diet, the standard American diet. Um, basically, the majority of our diet in this country is consistent of processed foods. And these processed foods are basically added fats and oils, the bad kinds, um, that are really helped uh, meant to preserve the processed food, um, refined sugars that are basically going to lead to insulin spikes and subsequently diabetes, and refined grains that have no real nutritional value at all other than uh, carbohydrate having energy in it. All the real nutrients is stripped away from it. Um, you know, the other main um, composition of the standard American diet is animal products. We love our meat in this country. And, you know, that's, you know, if you go into climate change, that, that's a whole problem in itself. But when we relate this to health, the red meats are the worst for our bodies. Yes, they are high in proteins, but they are also high in the bad fats. Um, and unfortunately, in this country, we barely consume any freshness. Um, only 11% of the SAD diet is consistent of freshness from fruits and vegetables. Um, on top of that, only 4% of our diet is com uh, composed of whole brown grains. And these are different than the um, refined white grains as these still have their nutrients in them. Let's see, I'm getting comments. You all know, remember when everything was bacon flavored. <laughs> uh, what do you think of non-nutritional sweeteners? Uh, so, I would so stevia is, is a, a healthy one because actually found in plants. With the uh, non-nutritional sweeteners, I'm completely against them. Um, and I, you know, I find it interesting when I talk to certain people because, um, and you know, I'll probably include this tomorrow because we're talking about sugar. Um, the way that the um, uh, sweeteners basically hit our receptors, our, our uh, sweet receptors. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, X amount of times more sweet than, um, you know, typical sugar is. So it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to taste better. But for me personally, I think it tastes disgusting. It just doesn't hit my receptors right. And I feel like um, that's the same for a lot of people that don't like that, that artificial taste because you can, it tastes artificial. Um, you know, sugar is better in my opinion. And, you know, I can make an argument for a couple of different reasons for that. Um, but I remember when I was learning about sweeteners in one of my biochemistry classes in undergrad, um, my biochemistry professor um, was, he said that I will never have a sweetener in my life because he, if you look at the structure of the sweetener and there was some kind of poison, I don't remember what it was, but basically the functional groups or the, the composition of the artificial sweetener and this, um, <clears throat> and this to toxic, um, this toxin was changed by only a couple of functional groups. And, you know, me being, uh, understanding how structures work in, in molecules, a lot of structures that are similar structured will function similar. So if it has a similar structure to a toxin, it's probably going to be kind of toxic to your body in some way. Um, but I'm sure the studies um, aren't going to be done, or if they are, they're going to be in favor of the food industry. You always want to look at who's performing the study and was it peer reviewed? Um, yeah, I digress with that. Um, so with this standard American diet, when we look at the causes of why we die in this country, the majority have to do with our diet and heart disease is number one number. That's the main, you know, and this is, I, I put 2016 in particular because COVID has, you know, recently taken number one. Um, but you know, before COVID even hit heart disease has been killing Americans as the number one cause of disease um, for decades already. And this is all because of our diet. Um, 
On top of that, we also have high rates of cancer, and this can also be linked to our diet because we're not incorporating a lot of the good fresh foods that have the um, anti-cancer properties. And so if you end up increasing your freshness, um, you would definitely see um, decreases of both of these uh, dramatically. Um, and then, you know, you have uh, a couple of other diseases here. This one stroke is also linked to um, your cardiovascular health um, with Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, the scientists are, are, are learning that it's, um, there's, it's multifactorial. Some genes play a role in um, why our, our brain basically degenerates. Um, but they're finding that uh, the things that we eat and the environment that we're in, such as the air that we're breathing, plays a role as, it, as well as when you're inhaling stuff through your nose, you have neurons within your nose that can actually transport and absorb some of this material. And some of this can actually go into the brain and cause inflammation. Uh, diabetes is also linked to your diet, um, which I will highlight tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, diabetes and kidney disease are going to be linked as well. Um, and then you have a couple of um, diseases from um, viral or bacterial infections. Now, when we look at this in the world, now we have a pandemic on our hands. Basically, the whole world is dying of cardiovascular disease. And that's because, you know, the United States is the leading trendsetter for everything. And a lot of um, countries have adopted our eating styles. If you were to look up like where like certain fast food chains are within the world, you're going to see they're freaking everywhere. And, you know, they're, and it's addicting. They taste good. They, they were scientifically designed for our mouths to want to crave it because evolutionary, our bodies want to eat stuff that's fat, stuff that's going to be high uh, calorie dense. Um, but back in the day, we were moving a lot more. Now we don't do as much moving. And so this is why you're seeing higher rates of cardiovascular disease everywhere. So um, the USDA's abomination of a food guide was finally replaced by my plate in 2011. And, you know, it's still not perfect, uh, but it was modeled after Harvard School of Public Policy's um, Harvard Healthy Eating Plate. And so, you know, these scientists here or the people that were performing these actually know what good nutrition is, um, you know. The only good thing I can really say about my plate that was given to the, by the USDA was that both plates emphasize 50% of your plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables. But of course, the food industry is going to have a say in how this is designed so it doesn't hurt market. Um, so, you know, the dairy industry, you know, we, we need to have our dairy, right? Um, and so the original healthy eating plate that Harvard um, had did not incorporate dairy into their um, their plate. It was water. Um, they replaced it with dairy, and this has to do with uh, food industry interest. Um, and the other thing as well is uh, they took out the healthy oils. So there's the healthy oils are going to be the healthy fats, which I'll get into in a couple of slides. Um, the food industry doesn't really want you to distinguish between like good versus bad fats because right now we think all fats are bad and so we're just going to continue to eat those delicious tasting hamburgers uh, but uh, you need to be able to distinguish between those two different types um, and so they got rid of healthy oils altogether on here and then the last critique that i have um, with this particular um, uh, plate is it does not distinguish between a good, good versus a bad protein or grain. Um, I'm going to get into what basically that means in a couple of slides. Um, all right, I'm getting some questions. Let me read this. I saw that post about how our food and healthcare walk hand in hand. The reason is that our food isn't as regulated with what goes in, into it that inevitably makes Americans rely on expensive healthcare because of it. Um, is that like too far? Oh, no, it's not too far reach at all. Um, so it, it's, 
you know, we have many broken systems in this country, unfortunately. And I'm hoping that some of you guys will go out there and actually help change some of the system. Um, so we have to really look at our healthcare system. One, it's run by the insurance companies. Um, think about why healthcare, the healthcare system is so expensive. If you were to look at how much all the countries in the world pay for healthcare system, their healthcare, United States is number one by a shit ton. And not only on top of that, you would think, hey, we're paying a lot more. So that means everybody should be healthier, right? But it's not the case. You have, um, you know, higher rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer than any other place in the world. Um, and so this has to do with, you know, um, uh, you know, keeping the, keeping the status quo of keeping the people sick, but healthy enough to keep prescribing them whatever it is they're selling so they can make money. Um, and that's the sad truth of our system. Uh, if you don't believe it, do your research. Um, on top of that, if you look at, you know, you, you think doctors should have good nutrition, they should have a good idea of that, of all the four years of medical schooling they have and the four years of res residency that they do, and then maybe a couple more years for specialty. In that time frame, that eight to 12 years, only 10 hours on average is what a typical medical student will get in terms of nutrition education. So if you're not educating your doctors on what proper nutrition is, then you're going to continue perpetuating the system. And we have a system that we do. And on top of that, you know, doctors, there are good doctors out there that want to change things, but the problem comes where they're in, they're in debt. You have, yeah, medical school is quite expensive. And so if you're indebted to a system where you're basically having to find a high paying job so you can pay off your loans, then how are you going to change anything? Um, you're basically just the, the pill pushers in the, in the system. You're, you're, nothing's getting changed. It's not until you, know, you work your way up and actually have uh, a sense of you know, responsibility. And you know, that's why a lot of healthcare physicians will end up going into private practice because they don't have to follow the rules and regulations of like giant healthcare um, providers. Uh, let's see. Somebody wrote most expensive healthcare, but also the lowest quality and least effective one for sure. Um, I think at some point I watched a video by, I can't even say that guy's name on YouTube. And it said by now processed meats were um, at about the same risk of cancer as cigarettes. Uh, it's possible, I don't know. Um, I do know that there was a study done in China uh, a few years ago where they were looking at a correlation between um, where cancer is and what people eat. And basically the main conclusion that they were able to draw is that people that consumed higher amounts of red meat had higher rates of cancer and those areas that basically stayed to a normal, you know, um, fruits and vegetables or unprocessed food had um, lower rates. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when I'm highlighting the um, bad fats um, next week. Let's see, another comment. Uh, what is it about the composition of our diet that we eat that is bad for us? Is it too much, uh, little or something that is not good for ourselves, um, which can lead to cancer, heart disease, et cetera? So that's a complicated answer. Um, and so it's, it's all about finding a balance. So when it comes to, um, you know, ask me at the end of this, um, and hopefully that some of the stuff that I, I talk about in here will, will, you know, help answer some of that. Um, but if I don't answer it, see me after class, because this, this one kind of requires a longer answer. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad there's all this enthusiasm, uh, but I don't want to go over class and uh, we're already at 1025. Uh, but good discussions. Uh, so now I'm going to highlight some of the key food groups um, in um, the plate that uh, Harvard um, mentions. And so with Harvard's plate, we basically should be eating about 20% um, of fruits on our plate. And fruits are packed with vitamins, tons of water, as I have listed here, um, fiber and phytonutrients. Um, I'm going to highlight fiber 
in tomorrow's lecture because fiber is so important for the, our overall well-being of our health for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, I, what I want to point out here are what phytonutrients are. And so basically, these are a type of nutrients that isn't considered essential um, as like where body doesn't actually need it to survive. Um, but these phytonutrients does wonders for um, protecting our body for, from a variety of things. The main function of phytonutrients are going to be protecting the body from DNA damage. Um, and so remember, going back to um, talking about DNA replication and damage, uh, all this DNA damage leads to, uh, you know, cancer cells being able to exist. And so uh, if you're able to basically prevent that DNA damage from even occurring, then you're going to reduce the risk of cancer altogether. And the key phytonutrient I like, I personally love because berries are my favorite, as you know, highlighted by the berry pie. Um, are these phytonutrient types called uh, anthrocyanins. And so these are going to be a type of antioxidant. So we always hear about you know, free radicals in the environment and whatnot. And free radicals are very detrimental to DNA. Um, basically, these are the ones that cause the damage. A free, a free radical is basically a molecule that has uh, an unbound electron to it. And the electron basically wants to bind to something. And so um, a lot of, um, uh, which I'm gonna call it, free radicals will end up binding to DNA and that ends up leading to the damage. And so if you basically are able to neutralize that free radical, then, um, then the free radical can't bind to anything. And the best way to do that is by taking antioxidants antioxidants are going to bind to free radicals, so it neutralizes it. Um, anthrocyanins are the reason why um, berries are red. They're the reason why they, there's this, this hue of, of, of beautiful reds, purples, and blues. And, um, you know, the deeper the berry, the more anthrocyanins are present. So you really want to be eating, you know, any, any type of berry. I don't discriminate, but the darker ones are really going to be the best ones for you. Um, somebody asked, do fruits or vegetables have more fiber? Uh, by weight, um, vegetables will, um, because uh, there's going to be, there, there's still water in them, but um, look at how plump these are versus like a leafy green. Um, but, um, you know, on top of that, there's, um, you know, other, other components that are within here um, that make up the composition of fruit, whereas um, <clears throat> with, uh, vegetables, it's mainly just like the cell wall that's present. Um, and so that, so vegetables are going to have a whole lot more fiber um, in them than, uh, uh, which we call it fruits, but they both have lots. So, you know, e eat both. Um, if anyone is interested in watching the video, okay, I'll probably watch that later. Um, all right. So, um, you know, the other food group, vegetables, this one should be the majority of what our diet is com consistent of. Um, it should be making up about 30% of uh, the what's on your plate. And so the deep leafy greens are going to be what's high in fiber, iron, magnesium, and um, B vitamins. And it's, it is important to know, and uh, in case I don't um, mention it in one of the other lectures, even though uh, leafy greens are high in iron. Um, there are a couple of different forms of iron um, that exist. And so the one, that, the iron that's found in leafy greens um, or really plants in general is a lot harder for our body to absorb. Um, so that's why, um, you know, proteins are going to be the form that our body prefers to absorb. And so that's why a lot of people that are vegetarian or vegan might be anemic because their body doesn't officially absorb the iron from the um, leafy greens. Um, the best, so, you know, all vegetables are good. Um, uh, so, you know, don't discriminate against any of them, but the cruciferous vegetables, such as the ones I have here, like broccoli and bok choy, cauliflower, these are going to be some of the best that you can eat. And that's because it has this phytonutrient called uh, glucosinolate. And so this molecule, uh, when it's broken down by the body, 
um, has been shown to have anti-inflammatory and uh, anti-cancer properties. And if I remember properly, um, I believe it raises some um, liver enzymes that help with detoxification um, of uh, materials. Um, whole grains. So according to Harvard's plate, we should be eating approximately 25% of whole grains. Um, whole or brown grains have the bran and germ um, intact them. So this is the brown part in here. And so this is going to be filled with the actual nutrients that's good for us. Um, you know, bran is going to be filled with your B vitamins, minerals, and your fiber. Um, that's why, you know, bran cereal is so good for you. Um, and then the um, germ center is also going to be packed with a bunch of other nutrients, such as healthy fats like omega-3s, um, other kinds of vital nutrients and, um, you know, more vitamin Bs and vitamin E. Um, with the refined grains or the white grains, they're basically, they, they strip away all of this goodness for you. And so if you strip away all of this goodness for you, all you're left is with the starchy carbs and carbs aren't bad for you. You need them. Your body runs off of carbs. Um, but you have to also consider how carbs are processed in the body. And I'll highlight this tomorrow and, and I'll just say it now, just to, you know, yeah, the more times you hear it, the better. But basically when it comes to, um, you know, our body processing sugar, um, fiber is a type of sugar. And so <clears throat> because it is so hardy, it's, it takes longer for our body to process. And so when you have a food that has fiber with it, um, a, along with, you know, the starchy carb um, version of the, of the sugar, um, you don't get insulin spikes. You don't get these, what basically will lead to diabetes, which I'll highlight tomorrow. Um, it, and this has to do with, it takes your body longer to process this. Now, if you remove all of that good fiber and you're just left with these starchy carbs, your body is going to basically process this a lot faster. And if it's releasing a lot of sugar into your bloodstream, then your body is going to produce a lot of insulin at once so it can break it down and store it. And, um, and so that's why a lot of these refi refined grains like white breads and, and pastas um, will end up leading to insulin spikes. And you know if you continue to do that to your body, it's eventually gonna lead to type two diabetes. Um, somebody asks, I've heard that some medicines can't be taken after eating grapefruit. Why is that? Um, good question. Uh, so it has to do with your liver enzymes. So there's um, a few different, there's actually a lot of different um, liver enzymes that exist. And basically when it comes to being able to process um, molecules so the body can absorb them, there are chemical modifications that occur within the liver. And all these modifications are all facilitated by enzymes. And so um, the liver plays a role as, as trying to detoxify the body. And so anything you eat, anything you take as a drug is gonna get processed through the um, liver. And so what ends up happening is say like you, you take some kind of drug and um, uh, it's gonna interact with whatever enzyme that's gonna degrade it. Well, what ends up happening with grapefruit is there's a chemical and then I'm forgetting the name of it right now, uh, but there's a chemical in grapefruit that basically inhibits that enzyme. And so if you end up inhibiting that enzyme, then you can't degrade your, that drug of interest as fast. And so if you're not degrading it as fast, then you're going to have a whole lot more of it in your body than you should. And that can lead to toxicity. Um, so that's why you need to be conscious to see if the drug that you're taking um, interacts with that particular uh, enzyme. There's whole websites that you can find um, or, you know, ask a, ask a, a pharmacologist. Um, the um, <clears throat> other food group um, that I want to highlight are the healthy proteins. So there is a difference between good versus bad proteins, and it's all dependent on the source. So with um, Harvard's plate, they basically say we should have about 25% uh, of healthy fats in our diet. Um, and this is, should be composed of both 
um, proteins that are from the plant source and also from the lean proteins. And so the plant-based proteins will uh, mainly have vitamins, minerals, and the good fats and carbohydrates, such as your fibers. Uh, and so here I highlighted a couple of, um, you know, uh, plant-based proteins that um, have the highest amongst all the different kinds of um, plant-based protein that are, are out there. Um, I would say, in my opinion, black beans are probably the best just because they also have a shit ton of fiber in them. Like, I think from just one serving, it's one third of your, your daily value of your fiber intake, where I will highlight tomorrow that in the American diet, obviously, um, we do not get enough fiber in our diet. Um, and so being able to incorporate it um, with these kinds of foods is going to be a good thing for your body. Um, and then the, the other protein sources are going to be the lean proteins. And so these are going to be your sources of, um, from animals, um, but you have to consider what animal it is. And so the main lean proteins that people typically talk about are going to be chicken, um, which is mainly composed of protein, um, but the good kind of protein. Um, and the, um, uh, and it's going to have very little, um, bad fat in them. Um, versus, um, um, you know, fish. Fish is also going to be mainly protein, but it has the good fats in it, such as the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so these, so when you're considering the protein intake um, or your source of protein intake, try to incorporate these instead of, you know, red meats, which are going to, you know, play a, a really big problem in your overall health. You know, moderation, just if you, you can eat it every so often, but it's all about moderation. And in this country, we have none of that. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing, oops, the other thing are um, the healthy fats. And I have to emphasize this, there is such thing as good fats because everyone scrutinizes that all fats are bad, but no, that is not the case. Um, so the Harvard plate doesn't specify how much you need to consume in your diet but just that it needs to be incorporated into what you eat. And the two best um, good fats that you can um, intake are going to be the omega-3s and um, your good cholesterol called HDL, which when I'm talking about the in the lipids um, lecture, I'll go ahead and highlight more of how these actually work. Um, good sources that are gonna be high in these kinds of good fats are gonna be avocados, um, figs, chia seeds, fish, and olive oil. Um, I think it's also important to mention that when you're intaking fiber, fiber absorbs water. And so what ends up happening with a lot of people that um, will end up taking some kind of fiber supplement because they, they don't want to eat the fiber. They just want to take a pill like the rest of America. Um, they end up uh, basically getting constipated. And the reason why is they're not getting enough water in their diet and fiber absorbs water and that's how it's going to push everything out and absorb stuff if you don't have water or enough water for the fiber to absorb and do all of that then you're going to get constipated um and so that's why a lot of fiber sources um you know natural fiber sources are okay such as fruits and vegetables because they already have water in them um the other thing i want to add in here is portion control in this country, we eat way too many calories. Excessive calories are going to lead to fat storage. The combination of excessive calories and a sedentary lifestyle where you're not moving at all is going to reduce your life expense expectancy by two years. Um, and I'm sure it can be much more when it comes to considering what the source of your calories are. And so just to put this in perspective, if a typical man needs 2,200 calories in a given day and only eats 2,200 calories, there is no net um, loss or gain. And so he's not going to gain any weight. He's going to maintain his body weight. Now, um, if the man um, you know, needs 2,200 calories, but every day is, is eating an excess of um, 500 calories than what his body actually needs, in one week, he's going to gain a pound. And think about that. You know, that's uh, we eat bags of chips and all this stuff, and then just all these empty calories that just add up. And and it's no wonder why we have such a big problem in this country. Um, now, you know, if we look at the opposite of that, 
if that same man ends up exercising every day and goes into a deficit of 500 calories, then within a week, he's going to lose a pound. Um, so, you know, be conscious. Calories, calories are very important when it comes to how the body puts on weight, but you also have to consider what the source is and utilize those sources that I gave you in the previous slides. Um, perfect. I need a few more minutes to spare. Um, with that, I will uh, take any questions. I, I am seeing some questions in the chat. Um, let me go ahead and release the, um, the sign-in sheet. Um, and if people want to go and go sign it, then they can. If they want to hear the answer to some of these questions, let me have a look. Uh, okay, so somebody's asking, what is so bad about red? Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, so, and, and I'll highlight this in the protein lecture, um, which I'll end up incorporating with the, the fat lecture. Um, so with red meat in particular, there are a lot of the bad fats or the omega sixes. And so um, when I talk about the different kinds of fats, if we look at what omega threes and omega sixes, how they're utilized in the body, one of them, it has to do with um, cytokines or the immune molecules. And so, like I mentioned in the other lectures, the, um, uh, there's anti and pro-inflammatory molecules. So omega-6s play a role in facilitating pro-inflammatory molecules, whereas um, the omega-3s facilitate making anti-inflammatory molecules. And so um, in our particular diet, in, or before I even get into that, there's a, there's a, a fine ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. So you want to have, for every one omega-6, you want three to four omega-3s. Um, but there are so many, there's so much more omega-6s than 3s in red meat, where when we do that, we basically end up getting a different ratio, a very bad ratio, where for every one omega-3 fatty acid, which again, you should have three or four for every one, um, you should, you, we typically will end up having about 20 omega-6s. So instead of having one omega-6, we're now having 20 omega-6s from that red meat. And so that is going to facilitate a very pro-inflammatory environment in our body. And pro-inflammation is good in moderation when it comes to fighting off an infection, but chronic um, inflammation is not good for the body. And, um, you know, that's going to lead to things such as cancer, um, and, and other diseases, or it's going to help manifest cardiovascular disease. Um, and on top of that, it has some other, it, it, some of them have high cholesterol that are going to play a role in facilitating plaque formation, um, in the body. And, um, once we get to that lecture, I'll go ahead and, um, talk about that. Uh, somebody asked, are the percentages of my plate based on weight or on volume? It's all based off of volume. Um, and so usually they'll refer to like a size of a fist or size of a baseball or something. And it's all, it's all based off of volume. Somebody asks, this is going to sound like a bad idea, but what would happen if you were to eat more of the good fats when you eat lots of red meat so that they balance out? Um, well, I, if you're going to do that, yeah, you know, you're going to want to include a lot of freshness in that diet so it can push out a lot of that red meat. Red meat is very hard on the stomach and intestine to absorb because it's so dense. Um, it, it takes some time to actually break down and a lot of it, a lot of the time it's not fully broken down. Um, and so if you're going to try to include any goodness with it, uh, make sure you have fruits and vegetables so you can help push it out. Anything that's not used. Any other questions?